somehow you got here today, but is your daily commute anything like this? In the packed underground train, we all stare vacantly ahead. There's so many different ways that we use to cut ourselves off from our communal experiences. I can be checking on my emails or playing Fruit Ninja. Other people are listening to headphones or hiding behind a hoodie. Most importantly, no one's eyes must come into contact. We're all moving together, but we're all utterly alone. Or I can choose to trap myself in the bubble of my car. Only my anger and frustration with other drivers has the power to cut through the metal and glass shell. Because we choose to absent ourselves during this journey from home to work and back again, we don't realize what a large part of our life we're just throwing away. Across the world, more than a tenth of us commute for more than two hours each day, in each direction. And I believe that being in a close, confined place, an intimate space with people without making a connection, or cut off and isolated in a car, is not only unnatural and uninspiring, but not good for our mental health and deeply damaging for our sense of a shared humanity. But we can seize the opportunity of this time together in order to build bridges between us and improve our world. Well, here's how. Perhaps we can adopt my six-point manifesto for a commuting revolution. Point number one, inspiring conversation. Now, when train travel was first introduced, people couldn't imagine sharing an intimate carriage with a stranger without introducing themselves first. So manuals were published to help. Prepare for conversation by storing the mind with interesting matter, history, not forgetting the history of the present time, remarkable trials and crimes, and biography, particularly of celebrity. Roger Boswell, 1867. Well, today we can get our public transport authorities to encourage us to talk to each other. Have you ever noticed the immediate change in mood when occasionally you hear a public announcement in a sing-song voice? Well, why not ask your local transport authorities to empower their announcers to say something in the moment, a witty limerick or a poem or something that they just feel? By creating these common experiences, we can help draw people together and begin to break our habits of silence and separation. Point number two, campaign for better design to help us connect. There was one architect who designed a college staircase to be so narrow that students were forced to negotiate with each other in order to pass. On the innovative High Line in Manhattan, they're soon going to be unveiling these benches, and if you sit down on one side and then a stranger on the other, you can't help but engage in a playful game of seesaw. I think we can use technology more wisely. Rather than technology only serving to alienate us further as we retreat into our smartphones, how can we use technology to connect us more deeply and to merge our virtual identities with our real ones? Well, KLM has just adopted an affinity seating program. When you book a flight, you're encouraged to give your LinkedIn and Facebook details so they'll sit you next to somebody with common interests and friends. But I wonder how much we're really being encouraged to talk to people who are not part of our world already. How can we use technology to connect us more deeply, whatever our background and our social circle? Could we have an app, for example, that me as a cyclist could use to connect and help a new cyclist on their first journey to work by bicycle? Or another app, for example, I could put in my language skills and my route and, and then help a new immigrant learn my language and perhaps learn French or Swahili on alternative weeks. Empathy, number four. Now, can you just please find the surgical masks on your seat, and could everybody put them on, please? If you're not sure how, you can ask your neighbor to help, even if they're a stranger. That's fantastic. You're all doing very well. Thank you very much. Now, next thing. Hands up, please, anybody who's got a cold. Could just be a minor tickle in their throat or a sniff. Come on, be honest. I'm sure there's a few more of them. We've had very variable weather. Well, those with your hands up, please keep your masks on. Everybody else can take them off. Well, in Japan, today, thousands of commuters are doing exactly that. 
And they're wearing these masks, not because they're hypochondriacs and they're scared of catching the latest virus or cold. It's because they've got a cold and they want to protect the needs of the people around them. How can we all learn to become more empathetic and aware and mindful of the needs of people in that very moment? Can we become aware if somebody looks lost and show them the way? Or if somebody's struggling up some stairs with a pram and offer to help carry it? I think also, in order to encourage empathy, we've got to give ourselves and other people permission to connect. Now, one summer, I was commuting on the London Central Line, and every day I would sketch these very, very smart, suited businessmen on their way to work. When they noticed, they allowed a smile to escape their rather austere veneer. By staring at them intently, I broke a rule, but transformed the journey. Now, you might not sketch or paint, but you could choose to wear an unusual brooch or carry an unusual object. There's a colleague of mine, whenever he carries his double bass on the bus, he never fails to attract a host of warm conversation and sparkling comment. Number five, be on the car. How can we use our pressure on the environment to allow us to think about a world in which we walked more and bumped into friends, neighbors, and created serendipitous encounters? Can we experiment with not taking the car just one day at a time? And if we've got no choice but to carry out our journey on four wheels, what can we do to break out the bubble? Perhaps we can wave at neighboring passengers if we're in a traffic jam in other cars. Or more radically, can you imagine a world which we trusted strangers enough to share our fuel, our carbon footprint, and our car journeys with people going in the same direction? Number six, random acts of kindness. Now, the Scottish comedian and novelist A.L. Kennedy recommends that we all learn to commit a random act of kindness every day to a stranger. She loves finding a special little toy and then dropping it secretly into a stranger's lap or pocket and imagining how they might be feeling when they find out. It's the unexpectedness of such random acts which begins to break through the very tough、um, armor that we use to coat ourselves to survive our complex world. Punctured, we become more vulnerable, but in dropping our defenses, we can embark on an exciting adventure. Might be a bit hazardous. But it can nourish us. So, what's all this got to do with democracy? Well, I believe that we're increasingly filtering out those who don't share our values, so our lives are becoming more ghettoized. Google's just pointing us to worlds which are already similar to our own. Facebook's just showing us news stories which our friends already like. But for democracy to flourish, we need to be capable of thinking beyond our own interest in order to create a broader society. We need to start venturing out of our gated communities, be they real or virtual, to come into contact with people whose lives, needs, and desires are different from our own, in order together to start thinking about a shared view of the world that we create together. We are exposed to others beyond our family, beyond our,、um, beyond our colleagues, and beyond people we know for such a limited time in the day. If we seize this opportunity to come into contact with strangers. We can embark upon an adventure which can change society and make it healthier for us all. I believe that big social journeys begin with small changes taken together. So go on, please, start a commuting revolution on your way home today. <laughs>